Hi, my name is Marvin Four. I'm a cycling coach living in the Alps for the past 20 years, and my speciality is coaching people for events like the Etape du Tour. I ride between 10 and 15,000 kilometers per year in the Alps, and of course, I've often ridden the Etape, as well as dozens of other Grand Fondos. Together with the other coaches at Alpine Coles, we've coached hundreds of people to successfully complete events like this one. This video is for you if you're a relative new or inexperienced cyclist and a first timer at the attack. Your goal might be simply to finish or it might be to ride it as a real race as fast as you can. Either way, my team and I are here to help you. I want you to know that riding the attack may be a much tougher challenge than you realized when you first signed up. It's much harder than running a marathon, for example. So if you want to finish, you really need to take it seriously and train properly for it. The fact is that every year, as many as 3,000 people fail to finish. This is not only disappointing and maybe a bit humiliating for some, it's also a massive pain because you still have to get to Morzine somehow. And you may have to do a lot of walking or else wait by the side of the road for several hours to be picked up. You definitely don't want this. So do yourself a favour and carry on watching to learn what to expect at the attack and how you can best prepare yourself. There are no guarantees in sport, but if you follow these guidelines, you will give yourself a good chance of finishing the attack successfully. And if you want to go further, join the Alpine Coles community and either we'll coach you leading up to the event, or you can come sharpen your skills and ride the actual route with us at our May coaching camp. There are no guarantees in sport, again, but this will definitely give you the best chance of a successful ride in July. Let's start by taking a quick look at the route profile. It's 152 kilometers long with six significant climbs, totaling up to 4,000 meters of vertical ascent, which is about 94 miles and more than 13,000 kilometers. It's not the distance that's the problem. Most people with a minimum of physical fitness and enough motivation can cycle that far on the flat. It's the six climbs that are the problem. In terms of length, there are four moderate ones and two big ones. In terms of steepness, two are straightforward and fairly easy. The other four are much tougher, especially the last one, the Col de Juplan. The total climbing is almost half the height of Everest, and this is what will stop people who haven't prepared enough. If you've never cycled up a major alpine climb, you can't imagine how hard it is for the first few times. The good news, however, is that with the right training, it becomes more and more doable. So what does it take to finish the Etape du Tour? There are a considerable number of factors that could affect your performance, but I'm going to highlight the four, which are by far and away the most important. The first is physical fitness, honed by plenty of cycling. It's certainly helpful if you start your training with a good level of fitness gained from some other sport, but unless you're very young and very fit, it won't be enough. The more cycling you do between now and July, the better. The second factor is having the skills and experience to manage steep, dangerous alpine descents. During the attack, you're gonna to have to descend almost as much as you climb. The descents are where most of the accidents occur, so it's really important to learn the skills and techniques to stay safe. The third factor is a practiced ability to fuel yourself on a ride of this level. No matter how big a breakfast you eat, there's no way you'll finish if you don't eat and drink enough during the ride. If you've watched the professionals, you'll have seen them regularly eating and drinking. It's really important that you learn to do the same. And the fourth factor is to have the mental strength to keep going till the end. For many people, and especially first timers, the attack will be the toughest physical challenge they've ever faced. Whether or not you finish is as much a matter as of your mental strength as of your physical fitness. You have to be able to keep going in spite of your body yelling at you to stop. So with these things in mind, how should you train for the attack? There's no single right answer to this because the best training plan for you is one that's been designed especially for you. If you expect it to take 10 to 12 hours to finish, you need a very different plan to someone who is planning to finish in six hours. 
Since all sorts of different people will watch this video, it wouldn't be right for me to give a detailed training plan. What I can do, however, is to provide a framework and a set of guidelines for you to take and adapt to your needs. So first, I want to explain the key principles behind a training plan that's aimed at finishing the ATAP you tour. These are, one, your commitment to make training a priority. This should go without saying, but if you want to finish the ATAP, you must commit to a serious effort of preparation. Next, be consistent. You should be on your bike every week between now and July the 9th. Your training load will vary, but these variations should be deliberate as you go through a load recovery cycle. You should still train during the recovery weeks, although much less. Any extended periods without training will lead to stagnation and even detraining, so, so you must avoid them. Your principal goal in training is to build a strong aerobic base so you can ride hard for several hours without having to ease off. To do this, we recommend you train mostly at low intensity. It's important to understand that training at low intensity provides the endurance adaptations you need without adding unnecessary fatigue, thus allowing you to train more. Next, build your pain tolerance and your confidence. Endurance has been called the struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop. And that's exactly what it is. There's no escaping the fact that an attack du tour is going to make you suffer. The better you can train yourself to tolerate the discomfort as it becomes more and more pressing, the more likely you are to finish. From April onwards, you want to do as much climbing as possible, mostly at low intensity. As you get closer to the event, you should do some of the climbs at race pace, especially towards the end of your ride. The sixth principle is to increase the load progressively and then recover. This allows your body to adapt and get stronger. Remember, hard training actually breaks you down and makes you weaker. You will only get stronger when your body has the time to recover, adapt and rebuild. So there should be a big difference between your hardest and your easiest training weeks. And finally, include exercises to develop your technical skills, such as cornering, descending, and eating and drinking on the bike. Now you know the principles, we can look at how to create your training plan. I know this is too small to read. I'll tell you where to get it in a minute. The framework includes three phases, preparation, or training to train, if you like, which is from January to March, pre-competition, which is from April to June, and finally taper, which is the last two weeks before the attack. Each phase is then broken down into four week cycles, including three load weeks and one recovery week, with a target training load for each week. If you're over 50, however, we recommend you adopt a three week cycle of only two load weeks followed by a recovery week, and this is because you'll take longer to recover than a younger person. You can download this plan from the Alpine Coles website in the blog section, or just send us an email at info at alpinecoles.com. It's important to understand that such a structure is essentially arbitrary, and it takes no account of the total stress, the life stress plus training stress, that you will be under on any particular day. If you feel stressed and tired, and if you have sore muscles, it would often be better either to take a very easy day or not to train at all until you've recovered. Remember again, hard training breaks you down. You only get stronger during recovery. So how do you take this framework and customize it for you? Step one is to identify your constraints. It's best to be pragmatic about this. Pull out a calendar and mark off all your known constraints between today's date and the attempt you tour on July the 9th. These might include work, travel, family commitments, or anything else that will prevent or severely limit, severely limit your training on any particular day. Be realistic. Confirming it with your partner and family might save a lot of misunderstandings and arguments. Once you've thought this through, you can block off week by week the training time you'll have available. You'll probably end up with something that's quite a long way from ideal, but that can't be helped. It's the same for everybody. Adjust things as much as you can 
to respect the principles of increasing the training load followed by recovery in three or four week cycles. Step two is to plan your daily training time. Go through the calendar day by day and mark the amount of time you're ready to dedicate to training. Again, be realistic. If your goal is simply to finish the attack as opposed to riding it as fast as possible, there's no need to become single-minded so long as you keep up a minimum consistent level of training. It's hard to give an exact figure that would apply to everybody, but you won't go far wrong if you target five hours per week on average from now to the end of March, and then increase this to eight weeks, uh, sorry, eight hours per week on average for the last three months. Unless you're retired or have a different work pattern, most of your free time will be at the weekends. It's not advisable, however, to ride only once or twice a week. It obviously helps if you can ride to and from your workplace, but if it's not possible, you'll need to find another way to ride at least at once, uh, mid, at least once midweek. Doing it at home on a turbo trainer is absolutely fine. Assuming you're working Monday to Friday, your weekly schedules could look something like this. The first two rows in this table are examples for hard and easy weeks during the preparation phase, January to March, and the last two rows are for the two types of week during the pre-competition phase, April to June. Notice the big difference between the training time in the two types of week in the preparation phase, where we have six and a half hours for a hard week and three hours for an easy week. And again, in the pre-competition phase, where we have 10 hours for a hard week and five hours for an easy one. The key point is to adapt it to suit your own constraints and your lifestyle. There's nothing magic about taking Friday off, for example. Many people take Monday off as their zero training day, and that's absolutely fine. Now you have the time available to train on a day-to-day -day basis. You can plan your daily workouts. We're going to take the example of a hard week during the preparation phase. Based on the time you have available, you simply need to place the workouts as best you can on your schedule. The minimum time for a cycling workout is 30 minutes or so. Uh, so if you, only can, so if you can only spare 15 or 20 minutes, then it's best to do a yoga session instead. So in this example, I've placed yoga sessions on Monday and Wednesday with a short, low, low intensity ride on Tuesday. Thursday is a hard interval session. Friday, a day off to recover. Saturday, another short, low intensity ride. And Sunday, a long, low intensity ride. Please note there's nothing magic about this. And again, everybody's plan is going to look a bit different. You need to do something like this for every week between now and July the 9th. Your plan's almost certain to need updating several times between now and July, as additional constraints such as family or work events get added. When this happens, just go ahead and adapt the plan. If the new constraint only affects a single day, you can either skip the planned training session altogether or replan it for another day. If the new constraint uh, affects several days, it may make sense to plan the periodization so that you train hard in the period when you can't train anyway, and then you can train normally when, when, when you have time. The end result of all this work will be your own personal and unique training plan including the number of hours you plan to train day by day, every day between now and July the 9th. This may seem like overkill, but believe an experienced coach. It will give you the best chance of reaching your goal of earning a, the coveted finishers medal at the attempt you tour. Remember the old adage, fail to plan equals plan to fail. The quote's been attributed to all sorts of famous people from Benjamin Franklin to Churchill, but it's totally appropriate here. If you don't plan your training, things will get in the way and you will end up not only training less, but also less effectively, which comes down to planning to fail. Now I'm gonna get into the details of the workouts. During the preparation phase from January to March, a typical high volume hard week should look like this. The first and most important is a low intensity long ride starting perhaps at one to two hours and progressing to four hours. This ride should feel easy, at least for the first two hours. You should be able to talk normally throughout the ride and you should never be out of breath. 
Don't worry, you will ride faster than this at the attack. But training at this low intensity will give you all the aerobic adaptations you need without adding any unwanted fatigue. And it thus enables you to complete the other training sessions as well. The second priority is a, lo a low intensity medium ride. So one to two hours initially progressing to three hours. And the third is another low intensity ride, one to two hours. So this really puts the emphasis on building your aerobic base. It's not good to ignore the higher intensities, however. So the fourth session is a hard interval session. And the suggestion here is to do four times five minutes hard followed by five minutes easy. For a total of 20 minutes hard riding in four intervals of five minutes each. Do this on your turbo at home or outside on a climb with something like a five to seven percent gradient. Make sure you warm up first for at least 15 minutes. The effort, what do I mean by a hard effort? It should feel about seven on a scale from one to 10, where one is super easy and 10 is a maximum all out effort for the five minutes. OK, so 10 is your maximum all out effort for five minutes. You want to be at seven. You should be able to finish each five minute interval feeling you could you should be able to go on for at least another five or so. After six weeks, you can add a fifth interval. The fifth session is a mobility and flexibility one, something like Pilates or yoga. Do 15 to 30 minutes of this. This is important because cycling will get, will stiffen up your muscles and it only uses them in a particular way. So you, you need to work on your flexibility. The sixth session would be a recovery ride, just one hour really easy. And the seventh session, another mobility and flexibility Pilates or yoga type session. Now, these seven suggested sessions are in order of priority. Do as many as you can, but in this order. If you can only manage the first four or five sessions, that's fine. Still during the preparation phase from January to March, a typical low volume, so easy week, should look like this. A short, easy ride, starting at one hour and progressing to maybe two hours maximum. A mobility and flexibility session, a second short easy ride just an hour long, a second mobility and flexibility session, and finally a third short easy ride. These easy recovery weeks are really important. Don't be tempted to skip them. It's during these weeks that your body rebuilds and regenerates and becomes stronger. Hard training breaks you down, only recovery allows you to get stronger. Now, moving on to the pre-competition phase from April to June, a typical high volume or hard week should look like this. The core workout remains a low intensity long ride, which should now be at least four hours, progressing to six hours by mid-June with as much climbing as possible. This ride should feel easy, at least for the first two hours. You should be able to talk normally throughout and you should never be out of breath. The second priority workout is a tempo interval session meaning a ride with some intervals at race pace, the sort of pace you'll ride at on the attack. The pace should feel about five on a scale of one to 10, where one is super easy and 10 is maximum. I suggest doing two or three times about 20 minutes. You should be able to finish each 20 minute interval feeling you could go on for another 20 minutes. Do this on climbs during a two to four hour ride. As an alternative, if you're in a club, you can join a medium pace club ride, perhaps twice a month in May and June. But be careful because club rides often turn out to be too fast and, and they're going to be too tiring uh, to let you do the rest of the training. The third workout is another low intensity long ride, three hours progressing to five hours, again, including climbs. By now, you're likely to have a few aches and pains. So the mobility and flexibility sessions become more and more important. So, so make sure you do at least one uh, per week. The fifth workout is a hard interval session, similar to the one that you will have done in the preparation phase, five to six times now, five minutes hard, five minutes easy. You should only do this one if you're feeling strong and, and up for it. You can either do it on your turbo or outside on a climb, and again, this time the effort should feel about seven on a scale from, uh, from one to 10. 
Next up, six, the sixth session should be a recovery ride, uh, one to two hours on the flat. And the seventh session is another mobility and flexibility session. Again, the suggested sessions are in order of priority. So again, do as many as you can, but in this order. During the pre-competition phase from April to June, a typical low volume, easy week should look, in fact, very much the same as in the preparation phase. So a short, easy ride, one to two hours, uh, a 15 to 20 minute uh, mobility flexibility session, a second low intensity short ride, another mobility flexibility session, and finally a third short easy ride again. Again, don't be tempted to skip these easy recovery weeks. They are really essential. Now we come to the taper phase. So just two weeks before the start. During the taper phase, it's too late to build any fitness. So hard training is pointless. Uh, and, and I'd strongly recommend you don't do any hard training in the final two weeks. Your objective in this phase is to taper your training in such a way that you maintain your fitness while eliminating your accumulated fatigue. You shouldn't just stop training because that will result in losing fitness. So you need to keep going. And different people respond differently to a taper period and there are no hard and fast rules. But you won't go far wrong if you reduce your training load by 25 to 30% for the, for the last week of June and then by as much again for the first week of July. Listen carefully to your body and if you feel tired, train less. You will gain more by eliminating the accumulated fatigue than by forcing your unwilling body into yet another long ride. Now, finally, developing your skills, which you need to do in parallel to the, to the uh, workouts we've, or, or during the workouts you've just seen. The most important skills you need to finish the etap du tour successfully are, one, descending, which is way more technical as well as being much more dangerous than climbing. Two, eating and drinking while cycling. And three, the mental skills you need to keep you going when things get really tough. So let's look at each of these in turn and how you can develop them during your training. Descending is an important skill for several reasons. Firstly, experience tells us that most of the accidents will take place on the descent and will be caused by human errors. Secondly, there's a lot of descending, almost as much as there is climbing. Thirdly, the roads are narrow and a good part of the descents are steep with tight and sometimes unpredictable turns. These can be very dangerous for inexperienced riders. And fourth, you'll be surrounded by many other people of varying skill levels. The more confidence you have in your own skills, the more you can avoid trouble. Like learning to ride a bike in the first place or learning to ski, descending alpine roads fast and safely is a skill that can only be learned with practice. This is obviously a bit of a challenge if you live far from the mountains, but there are some things you can do. Let's look at the principles for high-speed cornering. The first thing is to get your position right on the bike. Look here at Olivier, who's been in the top 10 at the Etat du Tour. He's going very fast around a left-hand bend. He has his hands in the drops to lower his center of gravity, to give him more stability, and also to have better control uh, of the brakes. His outside leg is down and he's pushing hard on it. His elbows are bent, not only to lower his center of gravity, but also to help absorb any bumps in the road. He's lowered his inside shoulder and he's pushing down on the inside handlebar. And finally, very importantly, he's looking far ahead to where he wants to go. You should never look at the outside of the corner, always at the vanishing point round the corner. And this is because your bike will always tend to go where you're looking. When we teach people to descend on our coaching camps, we nearly always have to begin by persuading them to put their hands in the drops. I know it feels scary and less safe at first, but there's a reason why you never see the pros descending any other way. By the end of the camp, everybody says the same thing. You were right. Now I feel much safer in the drops than on the hoods. Obviously, descending is hard to practice if you live in a flat area. These are your options. Practice riding into corners at high speed. For obvious reasons, it's best to do this in a safe area. It's better than nothing, but will only take you to so far. Second option, take a weekend trip to the nearest area with some significant hills and practice there. And the third option is to book a training camp in the Alps with someone like us who can teach you proper descending techniques. Now, the second skill you need to work on is eating and drinking on your bike. There's a good reason why the feed stations at the Etape du Tour are always very crowded. 
it would be impossible to finish without eating and drinking on the way. If you have to stop cycling every time you want to eat and drink, you're going to waste a lot of time. It's therefore important to learn to eat and drink while cycling on varied terrain, including climbs and descents, and you should practice this on your long training rides. Here are some basic guidelines on the hydration side. Get used to carrying two water bottles and drinking from one or the other on a frequent basis. Always look up the road ahead of you while you're drinking and be ready to chuck the bottle in an emergency. As a rule of thumb, you should be drinking 500 milliliters, which is one small bottle or two thirds of a large bottle every hour, perhaps a bit less in cold weather, more in hot weather. On rides of less than two hours, you don't need an energy drink. Water is just fine. Over two hours, it begins to be helpful to have an energy drink in one of your bottles in order to provide carbohydrates in liquid form. On rides over three hours, it's important to do so. Now for the nutrition side. There's really no need to eat anything on a ride of less than two hours unless you feel hungry or weak. It's a good practice to have an energy bar in your pocket just in case. On rides exceeding two hours, you should plan to eat at least 200 calories per hour starting early so that you don't get behind. It doesn't really matter what you eat, so long as it's mostly carbohydrate and you can get it out easily and eat it while riding. Good choices include bananas, dried fruit, things like figs and apricots, biscuits, buns, new potatoes, cooked of course, flapjacks, and of course, commercial energy bars and, and, and gels. There are two places you can carry your food, either in your jersey pocket or in a special bag mounted on your top tube just behind the stem. It's very important from a safety standpoint that you keep looking at the road ahead while you're getting the food out and also while you're eating it. If there's any risk, just throw it away and grab the bars with both hands. Finally, mental skills. There will almost certainly be times on the Attempt You Tour when you wonder why you're doing this and you have to fight an overwhelming desire to stop. For some people, this will happen on the steep section of the Col de la Ramaz, the penultimate climb. For many others, it will happen on the Col de Joux plan, which is long and relentlessly steep. If you follow our suggested training plan, you will automatically develop your mental strength as you increase the length of your rise and as you increase the difficulty of the interval sessions. But this may not be enough, and you should spend some time thinking through what you will do during the event itself when all you want to do is stop. There are three main mental approaches that will help you to keep turning the pedals, all of which you should practice actively during your training. The first one is to have a clear reason why you're doing it. The second one is to find ways to reduce your perception of effort. And the third one is to use positive self-talk. So looking at them one by one, if there's no good reason to push on to the finish, why would you bother? The reason must be meaningful and it must be yours. It might be for internal, personal reasons, such as your own enjoyment and satisfaction, or it might be for more external reasons, for example, to raise money for charity or to please or impress others. Both internal and external motivations are valid and not mutually exclusive, by the way, although psychologists tend to agree that internal motivation is usually more powerful. The key point is you should think this through and be clear about it in advance so that when things get tough, you can remind yourself why you're doing it. The second mental skill is to reduce your perception of effort. The harder it feels, the more you'll want to stop. Therefore, any technique that can make it feel less hard can help you keep going. Such techniques include distraction, which means thinking about something else, such as reciting a poem or a song, or repeating a mantra, or focusing very intently on something else, such as the rear wheel hub of the rider in front of you, on your breathing, on your pedal stroke, on the, or even on the scenery. Or even just smile, smile to yourself. That releases endorphins, which are the body's natural painkillers. And the great thing about smiling is that it spooks the other riders around you as well. The third mental skill is to use positive self-talk. There's been research done on cyclists which shows it may be more effective to use the second person. So say things like, you are strong. I'm proud of you. You are doing great. You are living the dream. This is what you've been training for. 
Whatever you choose to say, it will be more powerful if you've used it already in training. So write down what works for you, invent your own uh, sayings, your own positive self-talk, and practice when, when you're training. Okay, so let's recap. Don't overthink this or worry about missing any one training session. Your goal is to finish the etape you tour, not to win the Olympics. And the training you need is correspondingly relatively simple. In a nutshell, spend as much time as you can doing the following. Just riding your bike, mostly at low intensity. Doing some long climbs. If necessary, simulate these on a turbo train. Learn to descend and corner at fairly high speeds. Learn to eat and drink on your bike. And finally, get mentally prepared for a hard day out. It's not going to be easy, but it definitely will be doable if you prepare yourself right. If you would like help with any of this, please like the video and put your questions in the comments below, and I'll respond very quickly. If you want to give yourself the best chance of success, join our special Etape du Tour coaching camp starting on May 20. The camp includes a complete recce of the course, as well as plenty of coaching on your skills and tips to have a great day out on the bike. We're also including a one-hour coaching session as soon as you book in order to help you customize your training plan and get ready. And if you want to go even further, you can ask us to coach you week by week on a one-on-one -on -one basis. For more information, check out our website, alpinecoals.com, or contact me directly at info at alpinecoals.com. This is Marvin saying thank you for listening. Good luck with your training and hope to see you on July the 9th.